Section six of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Novella Serena. The works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume One. The Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall Part Three. At six o'clock I perceived a great portion of the earth's visible area to the eastward involved in thick shadow, which continued to advance with great rapidity until, at five minutes before seven, the whole surface in view was enveloped in the darkness of night. It was not, however, until long after this time that the rays of the setting sun ceased to illumine the balloon. And this circumstance, although of course fully anticipated, did not fail to give me an infinite deal of pleasure. It was evident that, in the morning, I should behold the rising luminary many hours at least before the citizens of Rotterdam, in spite of their situation so much farther to the eastward, and thus, day after day, in proportion to the height ascended, would I enjoy the light of the sun for a longer and a longer period. I now determined to keep a journal of my passage, reckoning the days from one to twenty-four hours continuously, without taking into consideration the intervals of darkness. At ten o'clock, feeling sleepy, I determined to lie down for the rest of the night. But here difficulty presented itself, which, obvious as it may appear, had escaped my attention up to the very moment of which I am now speaking. If I went to sleep as I proposed, how could the atmosphere in the chamber be regenerated in the interim? To breathe it for more than an hour, at the farthest, would be a matter of impossibility, or, if even this term could be extended to an hour and a quarter, the most ruinous consequences might ensue. The consideration of this dilemma gave me no little disquietude, and it will hardly be believed that after the dangers I had undergone I should look upon this business in so serious a light as to give up all hope of accomplishing my ultimate design, and finally make up my mind to the necessity of a descent. But this hesitation was only momentary. I reflected that man is the various slave of custom, and that many points in the routine of his existence are deemed essentially important, which are only so at all by his having rendered them habitual. It was very certain that I could not do without sleep, but I might easily bring myself to feel no inconvenience from being awakened at intervals of an hour during the whole period of my repose. It would require but five minutes at most to regenerate the atmosphere in the fullest manner, and the only real difficulty was to contrive a method of arousing myself at the proper moment for so doing. But this was a question which, I am willing to confess, occasioned me no little trouble in its solution. To be sure, I had heard of the student who, to prevent his falling asleep over his books, held in one hand a ball of copper, the din of whose descent into a basin of the same metal on the floor beside his chair served effectually to startle him up, if, at any moment, he should be overcome with drowsiness. My own case, however, was very different indeed, and left me no room for any similar idea for I did not wish to keep awake, but to be aroused from slumber at regular intervals of time. I at length hit upon the following expedient, which, simple as it may seem, was hailed by me, at the moment of discovery, as an invention fully equal to that of the telescope, the steam engine, or the art of printing itself. It is necessary to premise that the balloon, at the elevation now attained, continued its course upward with an even and undeviating ascent, and the car consequently followed with a steadiness so perfect that it would have been impossible to detect in it the slightest vacillation whatever. This circumstance favoured me greatly in the project I now determined to adopt. My supply of water had been put on board in kegs containing five gallons each, and ranged very securely around the interior of the car. I unfastened one of these, and taking two ropes, tied them tightly across the rim of the wickerwork from one side to the other, placing them about a foot apart and parallel, so as to form a kind of shelf, upon which I placed the keg, and steadied it in a horizontal position. 
about eight inches immediately below these ropes, and four feet from the bottom of the car, I fastened another shell, but made it of thin plank, being the only similar piece of wood I had. Upon this latter shelf, and exactly beneath one of the rims of the keg, a small earthen pitcher was deposited. I now bored a hole in the end of the keg over the pitcher, and fitted a plug of soft wood, cut in a tapering or conical shape. This plug I pushed in or pulled out, as might happen, until after a few experiments it arrived at that exact degree of tightness, at which the water, oozing from the hole and falling into the pitcher below, would fill the ladder to the brim in the period of sixty minutes. This, of course, was a matter briefly and easily ascertained by noticing the proportion of the pitcher filled in any given time. Having arranged all this, the rest of the plan is obvious. My bed was so contrived upon the floor of the car as to bring my head, in lying down, immediately below the mouth of the pitcher. It was evident that, at the expiration of an hour, the pitcher, getting full, would be forced to run over, and to run over at the mouth, which was somewhat lower than the rim. It was also evident that the water thus falling from a height of more than four feet could not do otherwise than fall upon my face, and that the short consequences would be to waken me up instantaneously even from the soundest slumber in the world. It was fully eleven by the time I had completed these arrangements, and I immediately betook myself to bed, with full confidence in the efficiency of my invention. Nor in this matter was I disappointed. Punctually, every sixty minutes, was I aroused by my trusty chronometer, when, having emptied the pitcher into the bunghole of the keg, and performed the duties of the condenser, I retired again to bed. These regular interruptions to my slumber caused me even less discomfort than I had anticipated, and when I finally arose for the day, it was seven o'clock, and the sun had attained many degrees above the line of my horizon. April 3rd. I found the balloon at an immense height indeed, and the earth's apparent convexity increased in a material degree. Below me in the ocean lay a cluster of black specks, which undoubtedly were islands. Far away to the northward I perceived a thin, white, and exceedingly brilliant line, or streak, on the edge of the horizon, and I had no hesitation in supposing it to be the southern disk of the ices of the polar sea. My curiosity was greatly excited, for I had hopes of passing on much farther to the north, and might possibly, at some period, find myself placed directly above the pole itself. I now lamented that my great elevation would, in this case, prevent my taking as accurate a survey as I could wish. Much, however, might be ascertained. Nothing else of an extraordinary nature occurred during the day. My apparatus all continued in good order, and the balloon still ascended without any perceptible vacillation. The cold was intense, and obliged me to wrap up closely in an overcoat. When darkness came over the earth I betook myself to bed although it was for many hours afterward broad daylight all around my immediate situation. The water-clock was punctual in its duty, and I slept until the next morning soundly, with the exception of a periodical interruption. April 4th. Arose in good health and spirits, and was astonished at the singular change which had taken place in the appearance of the sea. It had lost, in a great measure, the deep tint of blue it had hitherto worn, being now of a greyish white, and of a lustre dazzling to the eye. The islands were no longer visible, whether they had passed down the horizon to the southeast, or whether my increasing elevation had left them out of sight, it is impossible to say. I was inclined, however, to the latter opinion. The rim of ice to the northward was growing more and more apparent, cold by no means so intense. Nothing of importance occurred, and I passed the day in reading, having taken care to supply myself with books. April 5th. Beheld the singular phenomenon of the sun rising, while nearly the whole visible surface of the earth continued to be involved in darkness. In time, however, the light spread itself over all, and I again saw the line of ice to the northward. It was now very distinct, and appeared of a much darker hue than the waters of the ocean. I was evidently approaching it, and with great rapidity, fancied I could again distinguish a strip of land to the eastward, and one also to the westward, but could not be certain. Weather moderate, 
Nothing of any consequence happened during the day. Went early to bed. April 6th. Was surprised at finding the rim of ice at a very moderate distance, and an immense field of the same material stretching away off to the horizon in the north. It was evident that if the balloon held its present course, it would soon arrive above the frozen ocean, and I had now little doubt of ultimately seeing the pole. During the whole of the day I continued to near the ice. Toward night the limits of my horizon very suddenly and materially increased, owing undoubtedly to the earth's form of being that of an oblate spheroid, and my arriving above the flattened regions in the vicinity of the Arctic Circle. When darkness at length overtook me, I went to bed in great anxiety, fearing to pass over the object of so much curiosity, when I should have no opportunity of observing it. April 7th. Arose early, and, to my great joy, at length beheld what there could be no hesitation in supposing the northern pole itself. It was there beyond a doubt, and immediately beneath my feet. But, alas, I had now ascended to so vast a distance that nothing could with accuracy be discerned. Indeed, to judge from the progression of the numbers indicating my various altitudes, respectively, at different periods between 6 a.m. on the 2nd of April and 20 minutes before 9 a.m. of the same day, at which time the barometer ran down, it might be fairly inferred that the balloon had now, at four o'clock in the morning of April the 7th, reached a height of not less, certainly, than 7,254 miles above the surface of the sea. This elevation may appear immense, but the estimate upon which it is calculated gave a result in all probability far inferior to the truth. At all events I undoubtedly beheld the whole of the earth's major diameter. The entire northern hemisphere lay beneath me, like a chart, orthographically projected, and the great circle of the equator itself formed the boundary line of my horizon. Your excellencies may, however, readily imagine that the confined regions hitherto unexplored within the limits of the Arctic Circle, although situated directly beneath me, and therefore seen without any appearance of being foreshortened, were still in themselves comparatively too diminutive, and at too great a distance from the point of sight to admit of any very accurate examination. Nevertheless, what could be seen was of a nature singular and exciting. Northwardly, from that huge rim before mentioned, and which, with slight qualification, may be called the limit of human discovery in these regions, one unbroken, or nearly unbroken, sheet of ice continues to extend. In the first few degrees of this its progress, its surface is very sensibly flattened, farther on depressed into a plain, and finally, becoming not a little concave. It terminates, at the pole itself, in a circular centre, sharply defined, whose apparent diameter subtended at the balloon an angle of about sixty-five seconds, and whose dusky hue, varying in intensity, was at all times darker than any other spot upon the visible hemisphere, and occasionally deepened into the most absolute and impenetrable blackness. Farther than this, little could be ascertained. By twelve o'clock the circular centre had materially decreased in circumference, and by seven p.m. I lost sight of it entirely. The balloon passing over the western limb of the ice, and floating away rapidly in the direction of the equator. April 8th found a sensible diminution in the Earth's apparent diameter, besides a material alteration in its general colour and appearance. The whole visible area partook in different degrees of a tint of pale yellow, and in some portions had acquired a brilliancy even painful to the eye. My view downward was also considerably impeded by the dense atmosphere in the vicinity of the surface being loaded with clouds, between whose masses I could only now and then obtain a glimpse of the earth itself. This difficulty of direct vision had troubled me more or less for the last forty-eight hours, but my present enormous elevation brought closer together, as it were, the floating bodies of vapour, and the inconvenience became, of course, more and more palpable in proportion to my ascent. 
nevertheless i could easily perceive that the balloon now hovered above the range of great lakes in the continent of north america and was holding a course due south which would bring me to the tropics this circumstance did not fail to give me the most heartful satisfaction and i hailed it as a happy omen of ultimate success indeed the direction i had hitherto taken had filled me with uneasiness for it was evident that had i continued it much longer there would have been no possibility of my arriving at the moon at all whose orbit is inclined to the elliptic at only the small angle of five degrees eight feet forty eight inches april ninth to-day the earth's diameter was greatly diminished and the color of the surface assumed hourly a deeper tint of yellow the balloon kept steadily on her course to the southward and arrived at nine p m over the northern edge of the mexican gulf april tenth i was suddenly aroused from slumber about five o'clock this morning by a loud crackling and terrific sound for which i could no manner account it was of a very brief duration but while it lasted resembled nothing in the world of which i had any previous experience it is needless to say that i became excessively alarmed having in the first instance attributed the noise to the bursting of the balloon i examined all my apparatus however with great attention and could discover nothing out of order spent a great part of the day in meditating upon an occurrence so extraordinary but could find no means whatever of accounting for it went to bed dissatisfied and in a state of great anxiety and agitation april eleventh found a startling diminution in the apparent diameter of the earth and a considerable increase now observable for the first time in that of the moon itself which wanted only a few days of being full it now required long and excessive labor to condense within the chamber sufficient atmospheric air for the sustenance of life april twelfth a singular alteration took place in regard to the direction of the balloon and although fully anticipated afforded me the most unequivocal delight having reached in its former course about the twentieth parallel of southern latitude it turned off suddenly at an acute angle to the eastward and thus proceeded throughout the day keeping nearly if not altogether in the exact plane of the lunar eclipse what was worthy of remark a very perceptible vacillation in the car was a consequence of this change of route a vacillation which prevailed in more or less degree for a period of many hours april thirteenth was again very much alarmed by a repetition of the loud crackling noise which terrified me on the tenth thought long upon the subject but was unable to form any satisfactory conclusion great decrease in the earth's apparent diameter which now subtended from the balloon at an angle of very little more than twenty-five degrees the moon could not be seen at all being nearly in my zenith i still continued in the plane of the ellipse but made little progress to the eastward april fourteenth extremely rapid decrease in the diameter of the earth to-day i became strongly impressed with the idea that the balloon was now actually running up the line of apsides to the point of perigee in other words holding the direct course which would bring it immediately to the moon in that part of its orbit the nearest to the earth the moon itself was directly overhead and consequently hidden from my view great and long continued labor necessary for the condensation of the atmosphere april fifteenth not even the outlines of continents and seas could now be traced upon the earth with anything approaching distinctness about twelve o'clock i became aware for the third time of that appalling sound which had so astonished me before it now however continued for some moments and gathered intensity as it continued at length while stupefied and terror-stricken i stood in expectation of i knew not what hideous destruction the car vibrated with excessive violence and a gigantic and flaming mass of some material which i could not distinguish came with a voice of a thousand thunders roaring and booming by the balloon when my fears and astonishment had in some degree subsided i had little difficulty in supposing it to be some mighty volcanic fragment ejected from that world to which i was so rapidly approaching 
and in all probability one of that singular class of substances occasionally picked up on the earth, and termed meteoric stones for want of a better appellation. April 16th. Today, looking upward as well as I could, through each of the side windows alternately, I beheld, to my great delight, a very small portion of the moon's disk protruding, as it were, on all sides beyond the huge circumference of the balloon. My agitation was extreme, for I had now little doubt of soon reaching the end of my perilous voyage. Indeed, the labor now required by the condenser had increased to a most oppressive degree, and allowed me scarcely any respite from exertion. Sleep was a matter nearly out of the question. I became quite ill, and my frame trembled with exhaustion. It was impossible that human nature could endure this state of intense suffering much longer. During the now brief interval of darkness, a meteoric stone again passed in my vicinity, and the frequency of these phenomena began to occasion me much apprehension. April 17th. This morning proves an epoch in my voyage. It will be remembered that, on the 13th, the earth subtended at an angular breadth of twenty-five degrees. On the fourteenth, this had greatly diminished. On the fifteenth, a still more remarkable decrease was observable, and on retiring on the night of the sixteenth, I had noticed an angle of no more than about seven degrees and fifteen minutes. What, therefore, must have been my amazement, on awakening from a brief and disturbed slumber, on the morning of this day, the seventeenth, at finding the surface beneath me so suddenly and wonderfully augmented in volume, as to subtend no less than thirty-nine degrees in apparent angular diameter. I was thunderstruck. No words can give any adequate idea of the extreme, the absolute horror and astonishment, with which I was seized, possessed, and altogether overwhelmed. My knees tottered beneath me, my teeth chattered, my hair started up on end. The balloon, then, had actually burst. These were the first tumultuous ideas that hurried through my mind. The balloon had positively burst. I was falling, falling with the most impetuous, the most unparalleled velocity. To judge by the immense distance already so quickly passed over, it could not be more than ten minutes, at the farthest, before I should meet the surface of the earth, and be hurled into annihilation. But at length reflection came to my relief. I paused. I considered, and I began to doubt. The matter was impossible. I could not, in any reason, have so rapidly come down. Besides, although I was evidently approaching the surface below me, it was with a speed by no means commensurate with the velocity I had at first so horribly conceived. This consideration served to calm the perturbation of my mind, and I finally succeeded in regarding the phenomenon in its proper point of view. In fact, amazement must have fairly deprived me of my senses when I could not see the vast difference in appearance between the surface below me and the surface of my mother earth. The latter was indeed over my head and completely hidden by the balloon, while the moon, the moon itself in all its glory, lay beneath me and at my feet. The stupor and surprise produced in my mind by this extraordinary change in the posture of affairs was perhaps after all, that part of the adventure least susceptible of explanation. For the bouleversement in itself was not only natural and inevitable, but had been long actually anticipated as a circumstance to be expected whenever I should arrive at that exact point of my voyage where the attraction of the planet should be superseded by the attraction of the satellite, or more precisely, where the gravitation of the balloon toward the earth should be less powerful than its gravitation toward the moon. To be sure I arose from a sound slumber, with all my senses in confusion, to the contemplation of a very startling phenomenon, and one which, although expected, was not expected at the moment. The revolution itself must, of course, have taken place in an easy and gradual manner, and it is by no means clear that, had I even been awake at the time of the occurrence, I should have been made aware of it by any internal evidence of an inversion, that is to say, by any inconvenience or disarrangement, either about my person or about my apparatus. It is almost needless to say that, upon coming to a due sense of my situation, and emerging from the terror which had absorbed every faculty of my soul, my attention was, in the first place, 
wholly directed to the contemplation of the general physical appearance of the moon it lay beneath me like a chart and although i judged it to be still at no inconsiderable distance the indentures of its surface were defined to my vision with a most striking and altogether unaccountable distinctness the entire absence of ocean or sea and indeed of any lake or river or body of water whatsoever struck me at first glance as the most extraordinary feature in its geological condition yet strange to say I beheld vast level regions of a character decidedly alluvial. Although by far the greater portion of the hemisphere in sight was covered with innumerable volcanic mountains, conical in shape, and having more the appearance of artificial than of natural protuberance. The highest among them does not exceed three and three-quarter miles in perpendicular elevation, but a map of the volcanic districts of the Campi Flagre would afford to your excellencies a better idea of their general surface than any unworthy description i might think proper to attempt the greater part of them were in a state of evident eruption and gave me fearfully to understand their fury and their power by the repeated thunders of the miscalled meteoric stones which now rushed upward by the balloon with a frequency more and more appalling april eighteenth Today I found an enormous increase in the moon's apparent bulk, and the evidently accelerated velocity of my descent began to fill me with alarm. It will be remembered that, in the earliest stage of my speculations upon the possibility of a passage to the moon, the existence, in its vicinity, of an atmosphere dense in proportion to the bulk of the planet had entered largely into my calculations. This, too, in spite of many theories to the contrary, and, it may be added, in spite of a general disbelief in the existence of any lunar atmosphere at all. But in addition to what I have already urged in regard to Anchus Comet and the zodiacal light, I had been strengthened in my opinions by certain observations of Mr. Schroeder of Lilienthal. He observed the moon when two days and a half old, in the evening soon after sunset, before the dark part was visible, and continued to watch it until it became visible the two cusps appearing, tapering in a very sharp, faint prolongation, each exhibiting its farthest extremity faintly illuminated by the solar rays, before any part of the dark hemisphere was visible. Soon afterward, the whole dark limb became illuminated. This prolongation of the cusps beyond the semicircle, I thought, must have arisen from the refraction of the sun's rays by the moon's atmosphere. I computed, also, the height of the atmosphere, which could refract light enough into its dark hemisphere to produce a twilight more luminous than the light reflected from the earth when the moon is about thirty-two degrees from the new, to be one thousand three hundred fifty-six Paris feet. In this view, I suppose the greatest height capable of refracting the solar ray to be five thousand three hundred seventy-six feet. My ideas on this topic had also received confirmation by a passage in the eighty-second volume of the Philosophical Transactions, in which it is stated that an occultation of Jupiter's satellites, the third disappeared after having been about one or two degrees of time indistinct, and the fourth became indiscernible near the limb. Cassini frequently observed Saturn, Jupiter, and the fixed stars, when approaching the moon to occultation, to have their circular figure changed into an oval one, and, in other occultations, he found no alteration of figure at all. Hence it might be supposed that at some times, and not at others, there is a dense matter encompassing the moon, wherein the rays of the stars are refracted. Upon the resistance, or, more properly, upon the support of an atmosphere existing in the state of density imagined, I had, of course, entirely depended for the safety of my ultimate descent. Should I then, after all, prove to have been mistaken, I had in consequence nothing better to expect, as a finale to my adventure, than being dashed into atoms against the rugged surface of the satellite. And, indeed, I had now every reason to be terrified. My distance from the moon was comparatively trifling, while the labor required by the condenser was diminished not at all, and I could discover no indication whatever of a decreasing rarity in the air. April 19th. This morning, to my great joy, about nine o'clock, the surface of the moon being frightfully near, and my apprehensions excited to the utmost, the pump of my condenser at length gave evident tokens of an alteration in the atmosphere. By ten, I had reason to believe its density considerably increased. 
by eleven, very little labor was necessary at the apparatus, and at twelve o'clock, with some hesitation, I ventured to unscrew the tourniquet, when, finding no inconvenience from having done so, I finally threw open the gum-elastic chamber and unrigged it from around the car. As might have been expected, spasms and violent headache were the immediate consequences of an experiment so precipitate and full of danger. But these and other difficulties attending respiration, as they were by no means so great as to put me in peril of my life, I determined to endure as best I could. In consideration of my leaving them behind me momently in my approach to the denser strata near the moon, this approach, however, was still impetuous in the extreme, and it soon became alarmingly certain that, although I had probably not been deceived in the expectation of an atmosphere dense in proportion to the mass of the satellite, still I had been wrong in supposing this density, even at the surface, at all adequate to the support of the great weight contained in the car of my balloon. Yet this should have been the case, and in equal degree as at the surface of the earth. The actual gravity of bodies at either planet supposed in the ratio of the atmospheric condensation. That it was not the case, however, my precipitous downfall gave testimony enough. Why it was not so can only be explained by a reference to those possible geological disturbances to which I have formerly alluded. At all events, I was now close upon the planet and coming down with the most terrible impetuosity. I lost not a moment, accordingly, in throwing overboard first my ballast, then my water-kegs, then my condensing apparatus and gum-elastic chamber, and finally every article within the car. But it was all to no purpose. I still fell with horrible rapidity, and was now not more than half a mile from the surface. As a last resource, therefore, having got rid of my coat, hat, and boots, I cut loose from the balloon the car itself which was of no inconsiderable weight, and thus, clinging with both hands to the network, I had barely time to observe that the whole country, as far as the eye could reach, was thickly interspersed with diminutive habitations, ere I tumbled headlong into the very heart of a fantastical-looking city, and into the middle of a vast crowd of ugly little people, who none of them uttered a single syllable, or gave themselves the least trouble to render me assistance, but stood— like a parcel of idiots, grinning in a ludicrous manner and eyeing me and my balloon askant, with their arms set akimbo. I turned from them in contempt, and gazing upward at the earth so lately left, and left perhaps forever, beheld it like a huge, dull copper shield, about two degrees in diameter, fixed immovably in the heavens overhead, and tipped on one of its edges with a crescent border of the most brilliant gold." No traces of land or water could be discovered, and the whole was clouded with variable spots, and belted with tropical and equatorial zones. Thus, may it please your excellencies, after a series of great anxieties, unheard of dangers, and unparalleled escapes, I had, at length, on the nineteenth day of my departure from Rotterdam, arrived in safety at the conclusion of a voyage undoubtedly the most extraordinary, and the most momentous ever accomplished, undertaken, or conceived by any denizen of earth, but my adventures yet remain to be related, and indeed your excellencies may well imagine that, after a residence of five years upon a planet not only deeply interesting in its own peculiar character, but rendered doubly so by its intimate connection, in capacity of satellite, with a world inhabited by man, I may have intelligence for the private ear of the State's College of Astronomers of far more importance than the details, however wonderful, of the mere voyage which so happily concluded. This is, in fact, the case. I have much, very much, which it would give me the greatest pleasure to communicate. I have much to say of the climate of the planet, of its wonderful alternations of heat and cold, of unmitigated and burning sunshine for one fortnight, and more than polar frigidity for the next, of a constant transfer of moisture, by distillation like that in vacuo, from the point beneath the sun to the point the farthest from it, of a variable zone of running water, of the people themselves, of their manners, customs, and political institutions, of their peculiar physical construction, of their ugliness, of their want of ears, those useless appendages in an atmosphere so peculiarly modified, 
of their consequent ignorance of the use and properties of speech, of their substitute for speech in a singular method of intercommunication, of the incomprehensible connection between each particular individual in the moon with some particular individual on the earth, a connection analogous with, and depending upon, that of the orbs of the planet and the satellites, and by means of which the lives and destinies of the inhabitants of the one are interwoven with the lives and destinies of the inhabitants of the other and above all if it so please your excellencies above all of those dark and hideous mysteries which lie in the outer regions of the moon regions which owing to the almost miraculous accordance of the satellite's rotation on its own axis with its sidereal revolution about the earth have never yet been turned and by god's mercy never shall be turned to the scrutiny of the telescopes of man all this and more much more would I most willingly detail. But, to be brief, I must have my reward. I am pining for a return to my family and to my home, and as the price of any farther communication on my part, in consideration of the light which I have it in my power to throw upon many very important branches of physical and metaphysical science, I must solicit, through the influence of your honourable body, a pardon for the crime of which I have been guilty with the death of the creditors upon my departure from Rotterdam this then is the object of the present paper its bearer an inhabitant of the moon whom i prevailed upon and properly instructed to be my messenger to the earth will await your excellency's pleasure and return to me with a pardon in question if it can in any manner be obtained i have the honour to be etc your excellency's very humble servant hans Fall. Upon finishing the perusal of this very extraordinary document, Professor Rubadub, it is said, dropped his pipe upon the ground in the extremity of his surprise, and Mynheer Superbus von Underduck, having taken off his spectacles, wiped them, and deposited them in his pocket, so far forgot both himself and his dignity as to turn around three times upon his heel in the quintessence of astonishment and admiration. There was no doubt about the matter. The pardon should be obtained so at least swore with a round oath professor rubadub and so finally thought the illustrious von underduck as he took the arm of his brother in science and without saying a word began to make the best of his way home to deliberate upon the measures to be adopted having reached the door however of the burgomaster's dwelling the professor ventured to suggest that as the messenger had thought proper to disappear no doubt frightened to death by the savage appearance of the burghers of rotterdam the pardon would be of little use as no one but a man of the moon would undertake a voyage to so fast a distance to the truth of this observation the burgomaster assented and the matter was therefore at an end not so however rumours and speculations the letter having been published gave rise to a variety of gossip and opinion some of the overwise even made themselves ridiculous by decrying the whole business as nothing better than a hoax but hoax with these sort of people is, I believe, a general term for all matters above their comprehension. For my part, I cannot conceive upon what data they have founded such an accusation. Let us see what they say. Imprimus, that certain wags in Rotterdam have certain special antipathies to certain burgomasters and astronomers. Don't understand at all. Secondly, that an odd little dwarf and bottle conjurer both of whose ears for some misdemeanour have been cut off close to his head, has been missing for several days from the neighbouring city of Bruges. Well, what of that? Thirdly, that the newspapers which were stuck all over the little balloon were newspapers of Holland, and therefore could not have been made in the moon. They were dirty papers, very dirty, and Gluck the printer would take his Bible oath to their having been printed in Rotterdam. He was mistaken, undoubtedly mistaken fourthly that hans fall himself the drunken villain and the three very idle gentlemen styled his creditors were all seen no longer than two or three days ago in a tippling house in the suburbs having just returned with money in their pockets from a trip beyond the sea don't believe it don't believe a word of it lastly that it is an opinion very generally received or which ought to be generally received, that the College of Astronomers in the city of Rotterdam, as well as other colleges in all other parts of the world, not to mention colleges and astronomers in general, 
are, to say the least of the matter, not a whit better, nor greater, nor wiser than they ought to be. And the Unparalleled Adventures of One Hans Fall, Part Three. Recorded by Novella Serena.